Good evening, colleagues, those watching us uh, on YouTube, those watching us uh, on the Zoom platform. Um, we've got an interesting lineup tonight. Just waiting for a few more delegates to join in. We're almost at our halfway mark. There's close to 500 participants uh, that have registered, and we're up to 237 as we speak. Okay, for those that are already watching, uh, just to remind you that today's lecture accounts for one ethical CEU point uh, for full attendance. Uh, at the end of the lecture, there will be a question and answer uh, session uh, through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and the delegates will obviously answer accordingly. Okay, whilst we're waiting, just uh, a reminder for next week, uh, we've got SARS hosting two, web, uh, two webinars, one on the 17th of November. It's a men's health evening uh, with David Greer, who is a motivational speaker. And on the 19th of November, there's a YDC event with Dr. Tembuka Buleni. Uh, it's a practice management um, evening. Uh, so just diarize that for the 17th of November and the 19th of November accordingly. Okay, we're now up to 258 delegates. Um, let's keep a minute or so, and then I think we can start, Venan. Are you okay with that? Yes, yes. I'm, very, I'm in your hands, and we're very comfortable. So. Good stuff. Very happy with that. Thank you, Fabian. Okay, guys, our numbers seems to have stabilized around 262. So I, I guess we're going to probably get up to about 300, if not more. Uh, I think we should start. Um, so good evening, colleagues. Good evening, guys. Um, thanks for joining us this Thursday evening. We've got a good lineup uh, ahead of us for the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, the webinar detail is risk planning, investment and retirement planning, business planning, and holistic financial planning. Now, a few weeks ago, SADA hosted a, um, a, a webinar with PPS, and a lot of the delegates requested that we have uh, a follow-up webinar on exactly uh, uh, the topic that we're discussing today, which is holistic financial planning. So we've got two experts from PPS, Mr. Venan Dupree and, and Ms. Motshabi Nombete, and they're going to host us for the next 45 minutes uh, and enlighten us about holistic financial planning uh, for professionals like ourselves. Um, so... Wainand, Moshabi, welcome. Um, colleagues, welcome. And without further ado, uh, let's move. Let's move ahead. All right, uh, Doctor. Thank you so much. It is a great privilege for us to be here. It's a great privilege for us to be partners with Sada and um, all the amazing things that's happening. Um, I was so glad to hear that there are all these webinars and that there's interest. And it's always very, very. Um, the light thing for me when I hear that people say we want to know more about holistic financial plan because this is something that I think is, is um, that is in the times that we are in very very relevant and I think the, the world has moved past that place where people want to hear about products so, so I mean everybody knows that there's something like life cover everybody knows there's something like income protection and I think we've kind of moved past that so, so it's something that I am very passionate about so thank you so much for the opportunity um, to be with you guys tonight. So my name is Vainan Priya. I am the regional manager of a division called Specialist Support Services. And what my team does is, is we go and we help the sales force and we give technical advice, so specialist advice. So wherever there's cases where an advisor says, listen, this is, this is too technical, this is becoming too complex for me, well, my team goes in, we give the advice, we move out. So we don't own any client relationships. And we hammer in my team. The big thing for my team is to say, we want to look at a client holistically. We focus on holistic financial advice. And I think going forward, this is going to become more and more important. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to, to share that with you. And 
I'm going to do my best to keep it short, which is under the best of conditions, um, which I will would say very difficult for me, that I'm going to tell you all the stuff that I think is most important. Now, tonight's lecture is very special for me. And now you can say, yeah, you probably say that everywhere where you present, but tonight's lecture is very special to me because I'm going to share something that happened in my own life. So, and, and then I'm going to tell you where realistic financial planning fits into that. So it's something that I'm even more passionate about now um our baby came early and we i became a dad yesterday for the first time so so um we've got a little bit prior now in the house and i will tell you one thing is this uh, uh, what i've experienced is that you think about life in one way and in the moment that there's a child that comes into that equation you think about it really really differently so so um you know that you need to do proper financial planning. And when you have that little bundle of joy in your arms, you realize, I really have to get my house in order. This has now become a, a very important thing in your life. So, so a lot of what I'm going to be doing is um, I'm also going to share a bit about my own life. Now, holistic financial plan, let's, let's quickly mm -hmm. um, start off and talk about that. So, so when we're saying holistic financial plan, what is it that we mean by holistic financial plan? Let me just see my slide is not moving on. Right, there's my slide. When we talk about realistic financial mm -hmm. planning, you might have heard this term realistic financial planning. And Dr. Mansour has also said to us that we're going to talk about retirement planning. It, it, it entails everything. It's in retirement planning, investment planning, um, business assurance, all of those things. And that is one aspect of realistic financial planning. The other aspect that we are trying at PP is to look more and more at and that I want to encourage you to look at is, is to also look at yourself as a full human being, not just somebody who works and who earns an income and needs to do financial planning, need to do, for instance, retirement planning or take out life cover. What we try and do when we talk about holistic financial planning is, is to create this awareness that we as human beings are not just financial beings. We are not just work beings. We are people who are actually quite complex. We are people who are financial beings. We are also intellectual beings, professionals. We have a physical aspect in our life, a social aspect, a spiritual aspect, an emotional aspect, and environmental aspect. So the environment around us, obviously, but also the environment where we fit in as individuals. So we are saying when we're looking at you to do holistic financial planning, we want to also understand what is the stuff that you are passionate about. And I'll use an example early on to, to explain this to you. For us to really do proper financial planning for somebody and, and for you to do financial planning for yourself, you have to ask yourself, what is it that I want from life? And to best explain that, I'll use an example in our own life. So I sometimes meet with clients who tell me, listen, it is very important for me to leave a legacy for my children. Um, and, and I want them to remember me like that. Somebody like my father, on the other hand, says, no, um, I put you through school, I put you through university, and the fact is, is anything that you're getting over and above that, you should consider yourself lucky, because we are going to live that money out. And I often see them traveling out my inheritance. But the point is, is different things are important for people, for them to give us a, a good foundation in life. It was important. And he's saying, I've worked for this. So consider yourself lucky if there's anything remaining at the end of the day. So the point I want to try and make early on is that when we talk about holistic financial planning and holistic you as a human being, we are saying that it is much more than me just being able tonight to tell you, this is the checkboxes, this is the things you must look at, and that is kind of it. What we're saying is that there's also a softer side to that. So on the one hand, the finances and the numbers are important, but we also want you to just think about what is it that makes me tick? What is it that I'm passionate about that I want from life? Now, when we talk about holistic financial planning, now let's try and get into some of the nuts and bolts and some of the numbers. So, so I can categorically tell you tonight, if you are doing financial planning, you can't be a financial success without a budget. This is like the absolute foundation of financial planning. I can tell you now that you will find it very hard to be financially independent and a big financial success if you don't have a budget. And it sounds so simple. It sounds so straightforward. You might think, why on earth when we're talking about all these complex things like investments and asset allocation? And so why do we start with the budget? 
because this for me is the starting point of any good financial plan. I often ask people to give me their budgets or I ask them, do you have a budget? And when I'm doing a live session like this, I, I always ask people, you know, who of you has got a budget? And then about half of the hands go up. And then I say, who's got their budget written down? And then about half of the hands that's been up goes down. And I say, okay, but where's your budget? And a lot of people say, no, it's in here. But the reality is, is a budget in here is not a budget. It's just a plan or an idea. So, so I want to encourage you tonight, if you take nothing out from my session, at least go back and draw yourself up a budget. And that is only the one important part of that sentence. The second important part, you'll see here on the screen that the second important part here is also to track your budget. You can have the most beautiful budget in the world that, that you put money away and it's working out nicely. But at the end of the day, when you're not tracking it, you won't know what you're spending on what and how much do you have left to spend. So ladies and gents, you might think, why are we spending so much time in the beginning of this lecture to talk about something so obscure, seemingly obscure, and, and as basic as a budget. I can tell you from 10 years experience in this industry now that, that the budget is that one thing that really, really makes the big difference at the end of the day. If you don't know how much money is coming in and what is going out, it's very, very difficult to plan your finances and your life around that. So, so please, if I can plead with you, please make sure that you start with a budget. Then. We're saying when you then set your budget, the second natural step in holistic financial planning is to say, we want to set ourselves a goal. And, and this now comes back to what I said in the beginning, to say, what is that goal for you? That might be very different. So I'll share something in my own life. Me and my wife was very privileged at the end of last year to, for, to go to America and to go to Disney World, something that I always wanted to do. And when... We, we fell pregnant, I said to my wife, I would love to one day take my kids to Disney World to go and experience that with us. So that is something, and, and it speaks to that middle one that says fun, and this third one that says family. But the point is, is for all these things we want to do, we need money. Now, whilst life is more important than money, money is the important enabler that allows us to do these things. So what we then do is, is we will say, right, we want to take her when she can kind of appreciate that. So when she's, let's say, for instance, around about 12 years old. Now it gives us 12 years to save up for that. So when we save for that specific goal, we'll say it's specific. This is what we want to do. It's measurable. So it's going to cost so much. Is it attainable? Yes or no. Is it relevant in our life? Of course it is. And then time bound. The last one is to say, by when do we want to do that? And, and then what you do is, is you say, this is the peg in the ground. It's going to cost us so much over so much time. And we need to put away X amount of money every month to one day be able to do that. So that is just one example. The same old stew for your retirement, the same old stew for your children's education, same old stew for all these things that we hold dear. So I want you to just take a moment after our session and go and just sit down. And if you've got a good financial planner, they will also help you and guide you through that process. I want you to just sit down and go and write down what is the most important things in my life that I need money for, that I want to get out of life, and then sit down and plan, how am I going to reach those goals? Can you start hearing that this sounds a lot different than just putting money away or just investing in, in what asset classes we should put it? We will get to that. But for me, financial planning, holistic financial planning, says we are full human beings. We've got different needs and desires. Make sure to write them down and get to a place where you know how you will fulfill that in your life. Now, basic financial planning for me always boils down to this slide. Um, and those of you who are familiar with the Maslow's um, hierarchy um, of needs, this, this is the hierarchy of needs when it comes to financial planning. So what we are saying is, is there's, there's some logical steps that you take when we are doing holistic financial planning. So we've now spoken about you as a full human being and holistically looking at that. Let's now look more at the, at the specific financial finance, um, planning needs and so. What do we do when we look at holistic financial planning? You unfortunately get some really poor advisors out there who just wants to 
try and sell you a product. We are trying to move away from that and say holistic financial planning should look like this triangle. It should start with protecting you. So make sure that you've got your income covered. I always ask people, what is your biggest asset that you have? And then they will start telling me, no, their house or they've got some big investment. And, so, and I always tell them, no, your ability to earn an income, that is your biggest asset. If you take your income stream over the next how many years you're going to work and you capitalize that back to today's value, I can almost guarantee you that you do not have a single asset that is of that value. It is, it is really a big, big value. So we are saying that you should make sure that that is insured. When you've got this big asset, let's say you live in a very, very big, nice house and you obviously then, you, and, and it's really expensive, obviously you will insure that. And we will say then, make sure that your biggest asset, which is your ability to earn an income, is protected and that you know that's taken care of. So protection goes to your health protection. So, so your med typical medical aid, it goes to ensuring your income, but then also your life cover and disability and all those other things that we shall be will talk to us uh, about a little bit later on. But always remember that this, found, this makes out the foundation of holistic financial planning. I do sometimes see that people want to start saving and that is great. Um, don't get me wrong, I'll never discourage somebody to start saving and put money away. That's always, always, always a good discipline. Um, so please hear me carefully when I'm saying the following. You must do that and it's great that you are doing that. But I want you to just give a step back and make sure in terms of the triangle that you are properly protected. So make sure that you are properly insured should something happen. When, when we had our baby, and this is where I want to make it a little bit personal, when we, when we found out that we are expecting, the very first thing that I did in my own life was not to say, okay, I should start saving more money because my kid one day has to go to university. Whilst that would be a great principle, it is not the right thing for us to do. The very first thing that I made 100% sure of this is if I pass away that my wife will have enough money to continue living the life that she wants to live. And so I increase my life cover. And I'm all for saving and I'm in a, in a lucky position where I can take money and put it away monthly. But the very first thing I did when we, had, when we found out we were pregnant is to make sure that we've got enough cover in place should the worst happen that you are covered. So when, we, when we're done with that, when that is in place, we say, right, we start saving. And that is where we firstly um, make sure that we, that we start building a buffer for ourselves, a, a short-term savings account should something happen. Um, that savings account should have between three and six months worth of expenses in should you lose your job or should something like COVID happen, where a lot of our professionals are telling us, listen, we've lost about 40% of our income, 60% uh, income, of our income. Then you've got those reserves to live from. Then you start putting money away once that is built up into more longer term assets. And that goes then up to the next one, uh, part of the triangle where we say we put that away for longer term investments so that you can, that investments can grow. Now your emergency fund, guys, will not be invested in shares and in property and things like that. It will be invested in cash or something short term money market related so that you can access that money quickly. Your growth part that you're putting away, that is, that is over and above that, that savings account or your buffer, we'll put that in growth assets. So we'll put that in shares and in listed property and um, offshore investments that can grow in the long term. Right, then finally, it comes to what they call your risk, but your risk is, is um, uh, culminates into that real final top part um, where you'll see there's a bit of a target there. And that, is, that also comes back to Maslow to say, this is your self fulfillment part. This is how you say, we've done this whole thing now, we've managed the risk, and the top one is to say, what is the legacy that you want to leave? Now, um, we've spoken about a budget, we've spoken about the pyramid and the foundation. The third thing that is extremely important, if you forget everything else that I tell you tonight, you can just remember these three things, the budget, the pyramid, and the importance of the will. Then I will feel we've accomplished something big. So, so you will see there, those are statistics in South Africa. Um, and it's almost a pity that it's on there. And this is not a live session because I would have liked to ask you how many people in South Africa do have a will. 
I, I, I work in this industry and I was even shocked when I saw the stat. They say that only 14% um, of people in South Africa actually has a will. Now, I'm not going to spend a long time tonight talking about a will and why that's important. That is a whole lecture on its own. But I just want to say that it is really important to have a will because if you don't have a will, you will pass away in what they call in South Africa the Interstate Succession Act. And then the state decides where that money goes. So obviously there's guidelines in the act and I'm not going to go into the technical details tonight. What I will just say is, is a will is that document that will help you leave a legacy. A will will make sure that the money that you've worked so hard for in your life, that it goes to the people that you want it to go to. And that the uh, act or the state doesn't decide where that money should go. We have seen a lot of family fights around this. I've got a lady who works um, in my team who's very, very competent in this. She used to work for lawyers who were executives. And she, she told us horror stories of people or families who sat around the table who's fighting around assets that they didn't work for, um, interestingly enough, but he fights about assets. She said it turns ugly so quickly because there wasn't a will. And the wishes of the person who passed away was not fulfilled. So, so I'm just going to say that again. Three very important things when you're looking at holistic financial planning. First of all, make sure you've got your budget. Second of all, remember my triangle with, with the steps. I mean, thirdly, make sure that you've got a valid rule in place. Um, like I said, we don't have time tonight to go into all of the details of who can make a will, when is it legit. And so what I want to leave with you tonight is to make sure that you have got a will and that your will is updated every time there's a big event happening in your life. Okay, now what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to take you through a little bit of a journey of holistic financial planning. So now you've got the concept, you've got the basics, you understand how we think about financial planning, you understand how I think about financial planning, and I've shared a little bit about my own life. What we're going to do now is, is I'm going to go through four different phases and stages that we find ourselves in in our life. And I'm going to share with you what holistic financial planning typically looks like in each one of these phases. Now, I want to say up front that it doesn't mean Anything that I'm telling you now at a certain stage is exclusive only to that stage. We find this is typical. And if I, for instance, I'll use an use a example. In one of the stages, you'll see that we talk about debt. What is good debt? What is bad debt? It doesn't mean that it's applicable only in that part of your life. It's just where we find most people deal specifically with that issue. And the reason we take you through this is that it's not just boring. We don't just talk about retirement planning and then move on, talk about business shares, move on. I'm going to take you through a journey of a typical person's life and what we see in do financial planning for them in that specific phase of their life. So, like I say, very important, if I talk about budgeting here for, let's say, a student member, doesn't mean that budgeting becomes unimportant later on. It's just here where it has to start. So, so it's kind of overlapping, it's the kind of integral but I'm going to take you on a journey to say this is what we typically find. Right. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on a student member, but students typically are people who've got student debt. They are dependent on their parents financially and they might feel, OK, but they need to get a job. Their goals typically are to see the world. And we're seeing more and more, especially with the millennials, that people want a purpose. They want to make a difference in their life. We are, or it's, a, it's a whole new thing around impact investing. And so we, when we're seeing younger members um, have a need and desire to, leave the, to make the world a better place, which I think is a fantastic thing. Their long-term goals, obviously, is to have children, stock families, and their possible need is budgeting, financial education, and debt management. Small debt management, because it's only student debt, but that can actually rack up to, to quite a lot of money at the end of the day. And, and um, we're going to talk about it just a little bit later. Right. So, so budgeting here is very important. I think I've hammered on budgeting enough. And just in case I haven't, make sure that you have a budget. If I pull the budget out, and Michelle, I see you smiling, but if I pull the budget card out, then this whole holistic financial planning thing actually collapses. 
very difficult to have a fund, a successful financial plan and without a budget. It would always be as difficult as a business who doesn't have a budget. So as, as unthinkable as that is, it, it so it must be unthinkable for us um, in our personal life. Now, we're now really getting into the nuts and the bolts. So what, what we see is, is, and this is kind of where I am in my life, is, is in a place where we say, what is the planning that we do for young professionals? So these are typically people who's between, let's say, 25 and about 40 years of age. They might be people who are still paying off student debt. Um, we, we know about the whole phenomenon of black tax, and that puts a lot of pressure on a lot of people. We deal with that on quite a regular basis. They might make short-term loans to have some temporary relief, especially now in COVID. Now, I just want to stand still on this for a moment. Um, if you can in any way or mean avoid to have short-term loans to get you through the COVID period, please strongly consider that. We, we, we always tell people that if you don't have the cash in the bank to spend now, you don't have the money to buy something. So it is really important um, in a time like this, and I get it. I get it, and I've got so much empathy for people who's going through such difficult periods in their life. But try, 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 and stay away from short-term loans and short-term debt at all costs. Unfortunately, in South Africa, we have seen this phenomenon where there's a lot of access to short-term unsecured loans. And in some of those schemes, uh, it's not even a scheme, it's a legitimate bank loan. Um, unsecured loan. So it's not like you have to give up your house or something for that. These, these, the interest rates are so high and it can absolutely destroy you financially. So try and stay away from that. Some people feel that they need to get a second job and income um, and might feel overwhelmed. Now, their goals, I mean, their goals are their goals. I'm not going to go into that into too much detail. But that second one is, is important. They want to start making some good money. And then they want to buy a property and also have children and start families. Now, this is a this is a critical time in your life to start doing proper financial planning. And I want to just pause here and I want to give you one illustration that somebody who I work for always used and said, this is what financial planning is about. He told the story always about him sitting on a Saturday afternoon watching the rugby, and then the, the screen was kind of blurry. It wasn't giving him nice signal. And he found the guys at DSTV and he said to them, please come and fix this, um, this, this antenna at my house. And then this guy came out, climbed there on the roof, and he moved the shuttle that, that was on the, the antenna that was on the, on the roof only a couple of centimeters. Yeah, you know, and this guy was so amazed. He said to him, how can a couple of centimeters make such a big difference? Because now all of a sudden the, the, um, the television was clear. And this guy said to him, you know what? Over here, it makes only a couple of centimeters difference. But over the distance to where the satellite is, it makes a big difference. And that is also how I see holistic financial planning. A lot of people think I will deal with my retirement planning and whatever financial planning. So one day when I get there, it's much easier to start early, start saving, obviously when your insurance is in place, and to make sure that you put away and make small adjustments as you go, rather than trying to make a big adjustment when you're 55 or 60. Unfortunately, I see a lot of people who end up with us who say, listen, I am 55 or 60 and now I want to retire in five or 10 years time, please help me. And the reality is it's very difficult sometimes if you haven't saved enough. Right, so the possible needs here, I've spoken about an emergency fund. This is the time in your life to build that up. Debt management, to invest for specific goals as I've attained to earlier. To start saving for the longer term, once again, when everything else is in place. Mm -hmm. And then also maybe to consider um, in your will to put in a testamentary trust. That's what me and my wife has done now. I'm not going to go into the technical details of that tonight, but if you're interested in that, why things should go into a testamentary trust and not into um, not, not, not directly into your children's name, we can actually talk about that later. Now, I don't think I have to say so much about this, but what I wanted to say is, is Please, please, when you get to this point in your life, make sure that you do not fall in the debt trap. Unfortunately, in South Africa, um, and we see this more under our professionals than anybody else. We, people, 
um, really, really, really are susceptible to this whole thing of getting in the debt trap. So they basically do that in a couple of ways. One, when they start working and they start earning an income, they go and buy the worst thing that you can do for yourself financially. And, and it's so it's such a pity I don't have an audience in front of me because we always ask them, what is it that people go and buy? And they all get it right. They say, we, when you earn your first paycheck, you go and buy a car. It's a depreciating asset. So even though it's under good debt here, it's only good debt if you can't afford it and you need that for your work. But please make sure with your car and your house. Often you'll hear that people say, no, a house is good debt. A house, a home is only good debt if you can afford to comfortably pay that back. So please, if I can plead one thing with you tonight, don't go out there and make bad debt. It's very, very difficult to get out of the bad out of the debt trap and even if you're making so-called good debt i personally am very scared of debt so i try and stay away from that as far as i can and we really try and live within our means but even if you make it make sure that you can easily pay that up and if something goes wrong that you can easily still pay that let's say it's your bond um, and that you are not so fully stretched that you that you end up in trouble right so it's more or less at this stage also where it becomes very important to make sure that you are protected at bottom layer of the pyramid. And I'm going to just pause here and take a sip of my water and hand the baton to Mutshabi, who's just going to take us through some of the basic concepts that I've spoken about in terms of that risk plan, just to give us a bit of more nuts and bolts in terms of the actual products that we use to get that risk plan in place. Because at this stage in your life, this is really where we need to start getting that um, in place. So Mutshabi, Thank you. Let's go over to you. Thank you, Vaynant. And yes, I echo everybody's sentiments in congratulating you first for your birth, uh, the, baby, the birth of your baby, rather. Do enjoy the last two nights of decent sleep because it gets rather interesting after that. Um, and also do enjoy the ride. Um, my son is 14 years old. I remember sitting in hospital when he was born and now he's taller than I am. I've given up that fight. And my younger one is also fast approaching. So uh, I've made peace that I'll probably be the shortest person in, the, in our household. Um, so yeah, make the most of that, um, of this transition and the journey as you go through it. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time speaking about myself and where I come from, just probably the sum total of me at Mutabi is I've been in the insurance industry for 20 years and I've pretty much lived to see most of it and where life insurance um, and financial planning especially has hit home for me is I remember again, a story when I was quite young, a typical youngster out of varsity, had my first job, then I figured I want to be a manager. So I got a job as a manager at an insurance company, another insurance company, not PPS. And a month into that job, I probably had to convey the most difficult news I've ever had to do in my entire life. And I never forget that. I remember a family coming in, into the offices of this company that I was working for and their daughter, who was probably my age, under 30, had just passed away. And they wanted to find out if they, she had any policies, any money, any life cover, any funeral cover, et cetera. And I remember checking through systems and I had access to check for other companies as well. So not just for the company that I was working for. So I remember putting the girl's ID number into the system and it came, it does a search across all the companies and it came out that she had absolutely nothing. The way that girl's mom screeched sitting in my office, I still remember it. I can actually still hear how she wailed when I, I after I'd gone through everything, I said to you, I'm so sorry, Ma, but there's absolutely nothing. And obviously she'd been the hope of the family. They'd come from a rural area, etc., etc. So that I think it was, it was a, a terrible experience for me but it also did probably mold and shape my view on financial planning and most importantly, the importance of financial planning. Uh, so where I come in, um, I am head of technical marketing at PPS, um, PPS Insurance. I do deal a lot with product. Uh, we did uh, promise not to keep this too product focused, but I think it also is important because one of the other things that I have seen, especially this year when COVID first started. So when we all first went into lockdown and we're trying to understand what is this thing, and I think most of us were naive enough to think that after the first three weeks that were called on the 27th of March, we'll be out of lockdown, life's gonna happen back to normal. Bob's your uncle, when that didn't happen, 
and the reality of this COVID and lockdown started unfolding. I remember the types of queries we used to get a lot then. And a lot of it was around where you got the sense that people don't understand the products that they have. So I think let us spend a few minutes now just trying to understand what are all these products that are available to you at PPS. So the first one is life insurance. Life insurance tends to be quite a simple one. Growing up, I know some people used to refer to advisors slash brokers as the should you die type of people because there was always that the conversation was always should you die then, um, which is unfortunate to think of um, advisors in that way, but that was a joke when we were growing up. But that really is just essentially what uh, Venan spoke about, leaving that legacy, more importantly, leaving that financial capital for your family to be able to go on. I always say, like I said, my son has just started high school this year. If something were to happen to either me or my husband, unfortunately, the reality is school fees will still be due on the 1st of December. That is my reality. In my sobbing, in my misery, in my trying to figure out what just happened and dealing with, um, with my mourning, that is the reality. If you have a bond, the bond will be due, etc. So that's life insurance um, helps in terms of giving you that financial capital to be able to say to the spouse, to the partner, to the children that if the bond is still outstanding, here's a lump sum payment, you know the home is secured. And any other obviously debt, et cetera, that you feel passionate about, including then also having that kitty that you can leave for the children as a legacy to get them through university, et cetera. Disability cover is also another important one. Uh, people tend to think that disability is only for old people or that it won't happen to them. And or otherwise people think, Disabilities only if you get an accident um, and they're certified, they've got the advanced driving, they've got all this uh, wonderful technology in their car so they brake appropriately in time, et cetera, they accelerate, et cetera. Um, but disability is a reality and um, a, a disease like cancer can cause a disability. I uh, suppose in your professions especially, you might then not be able to perform your job. If you are diagnosed with, it could be cancer, it could be blindness. Um, Loss of speech. In my job, I need my speech. So if I'm not able to speak, that might qualify me for a disability claim. So, and with PPS now, we do have two types of disability and that's also in the industry is occupation specific disability. So that they we assess you as a dentist and say, if you're not able to perform your duties as a dentist then you would qualify for a disability. The other one is the functional disability where then we look at how has the disability that you have affected your ability to function, your day-to-day -day function. Are you able to make dinner for yourself and the kids and the family? Are you able to drive yourself to the office and get to the shops and do take care of yourself? So those are the two types of disability benefits that we do have, which cater for very different needs. Um, and there could be an overlap, obviously, because it could be that the disability you have means that you're not able to do your job and also you're not able to look after yourself, et cetera, at home. And with those benefits, we do have a discount if you have both because of that overlap in the definitions. Critical illness, another big one. Um, we spoke earlier on that it is men's month. There's a big focus on men's month and where men's health month rather started was with the whole prostate cancer, for example, um, amongst men. And then that's now that movement, the Movember movement has now grown to include other types of male cancers. Um, I think, and that was really just because those are probably difficult conversations to have about, you know, who do you speak to? And especially with men uh, and with all the love and respect to you, you, you soldier on even when you know that I'm not feeling so lacquer. So critical illness helps with um, stuff, the typical ones. There's the big four that we normally call for critical illness, which would be your cancers, all sorts of cancers, heart attacks, um, heart bypass, and the last one, a stroke. So those four, over the years in the industry, in South Africa and worldwide, about 80, more than 80% of all critical illness claims are because of those four. And what we are finding in PPS is that members who claim for one of those benefits are getting younger and younger. And the amounts that we are now paying for cancer, for example, are getting higher and higher. So that's something to consider that it's not something that happens to older people. Um, a stroke, we always used to think my grandfather got a stroke when he was probably in his 60s. So I've always related can a stroke with people his age group until I started um, meeting or coming across people who were much younger than 60 who'd suffered from a stroke, for example. Heart attacks, et cetera, that's mostly linked to our lifestyle. 
Um, so I suppose any one of us can get it at any time. So there's something to think about. Again, critical illness benefit itself is a lump sum payout that would then help you. Um, and the nice thing about it, obviously, you can, I mean, other advantages rather of it would be stuff like you can then also afford alternative treatment with a critical illness lump sum. An uncle of mine some three years ago was diagnosed with cancer and the treatment that he found in South Africa or after he tried all the treatments in South Africa, they decided to go try drugs that were only available in America. So they went through the whole process, getting approval um, through our own administrators, uh, the medical council, et cetera, the FDA. But I mean, eventually when all of this was approved, it was 60,000 rand a month. And he took that medication. Um, it probably kept him alive for another two years, but 60,000 rand a month is quite a handsome amount. Um, yeah, so those are just some, but luckily, um, if you have sufficient cover, you're able to explore those other options. And more importantly, able to just take a step back and focus on rather getting well versus always worrying and stressing about where, how we're going to eat, what are the, how are the kids going to get to school, et cetera. So that peace of mind. Then where PPS probably is the, well, our, our, what I call our flagship product, the one that I'm most passionate about, and really the birth of PPS is income protection or sickness benefits. Sickness and permanent incapacity benefits is what you would have probably seen. Um, there it really is what Vernon spoke about. Vernant, it's a late night, sorry Vernant. Um, what Vernon spoke about earlier, um, the ability to protect your earning potential. That's slap them in the middle of income protection because they will be saying, and especially in your world, is if you are unable to earn an income due to illness or an injury, then PPS will pay you for that time that you're unable to work. And just to put this into perspective again, in light of COVID, we at PPS have paid over a hundred million rand in COVID claims from March to end of September. And this is to professionals who are unable to perform their duties because of COVID. And these are only isolated COVID cases only. Obviously we've had a whole lot of other claims and we will release those early next year in terms of our overall claims experience but over a hundred million rand in COVID claims. And you are not, um, you're not gonna be surprised by the next number I'm gonna share with you that 75% of that hundred million, more than a hundred million was to medical professionals because you're obviously the most exposed during this period. And I just go back and ask the question, what would have happened to those medical professionals if they were not, and that is split between physiotherapists, your dentist, your medical doctor. So it's, it's the medical profession in its entirety. But what would have happened to those medical professionals if they had not had the safety net? They contracted COVID working under very extreme circumstances. I went to a dentist in the middle of hard, hard lockdown. I had a terrible toothache, so I had to go to a dentist. And I remember just looking at it thinking, I don't know how you guys do it. I'd been five weeks in the house I had not seen the world in that five weeks. And when I, when I got out and, I, and they had all this equipment and, but she was still bubbly, she was happy. And I thought, wow, it takes a special kind of person to do that. But the risk that she was willing to put herself through to attend to my tooth and many other patients for me was just, I was like, wow, um, wow, that's something special. So income protection, like we said, I just imagine those, if, just, if, you understand, if nothing else, income protection allows you the freedom to then be able to send the kids to school, have the investments that Vaynan spoke about, pay for medical aid. So all those little important things, if you know you have a salary, the peace of mind that if I'm not able to work, my income will be protected. That is a peace of mind that you need. Business assurance, I'm not gonna to go too much into now because I know Vaynan does, does have a few slides on that later on, but that again is essentially most of you work for yourselves um, or in practices. So you might have eight partners in the practice, et cetera. Over and above you protecting yourself, the individual, so that you can look after your family, your legacy. What about the business? What about your business partners? You might all be well and healthy and alive right now, but have you thought about what happens if something happens to one of our partners? Because I would imagine very few practices are one-man shows. And even those one-man shows do need cover because you don't want to leave the stress to your family once you are not there anymore or you have a critical illness. Um, I would not know how to run your practice. If, if, my, if my, house, my, my spouse was a dentist, I would not know what to do with that practice if he's not there. And if he hasn't made enough provision through business assurance, that would leave me in a muddle. And I would prefer to rather spend my time 
mourning and making peace and readjusting my life and trying to figure out what do I do with this big business? So business journalist is a big one. Then we'll, uh, then we'll speak a, few, uh, um, a bit more about the different types of policies we have in business assurance, and I'll be happy to jump in if you need me to. And then the last thing is state liquidity. Um, again, that freedom of you've lived, you've worked so hard, you've accumulated all of these assets. How do you protect that with liquidity in your estate? Because it's one thing to say, yes, I've got life cover. If something happens to me, my spouse will have something. Will they have that whole something or will they only have a part of it? Thanks, Vaynan. That's it for me for now. I'll give over to you. And then, like I said, I'll jump in any other time when you need me to. Great, Richard. Thank you so much for that. Um, there's so much to talk about. We are we're rapidly running out of time. So, so thank you for that. That was um, also very informative uh, for me to also just think about that. And, and I hope that you who is looking uh, that you can that you can understand. So those of you who's watching the webinar, that you can start understanding how these things integrate. So it's not about us saying, yes, products, buy our products. It's about saying, go and decide who you want to be, do proper financial planning, and then make sure with these products that Michelle we just spoke about, that you put all the, the stops and gaps in place to make sure that you're well covered and that you um, have peace of mind. All right, so then we move on to our next person who is our established professional. Sorry, they just went on. So for our established professional, these are people who is now typically in that sandwich generation, looking after parents and after children. Um, a lot of them is self-employed, which shall be spoke about that income that fluctuates very, very difficult, um, especially in, in a profession such as yourself, where something like COVID can have a direct um, effect on your, on your um, income. So what we do... Um, at this stage in your life, typical is typically is to do proper education planning. So it could either be to put money away or to make sure that you're insured. We make sure that we start doing retirement planning. It started early on, but now we really focus in on how do you want to retire, when do you want to retire, and so we do investment planning. Investments then um, becomes more complex. So we look at um, your asset allocation, how much money should be in which asset classes, how much should be in South Africa, how much should be offshore. We do estate planning. Now, that's a whole lecture on its own. We're not going to do that. But just shortly, we make sure that you are in the best position that you can be. So do not pay uh, excessive taxes. Make sure that there's liquidity in the estate, all those things, and that assets don't need to be sold um, unnecessarily. And then also we do business planning. Now, I just want to pause here. After this, I've got only one more slide that I want to speak about. So business planning, business assurance, very, very important especially if you're in a profession like yourselves where you're in partnerships. So what is business assurance? It's not your commercial lines of business policy. This is something else. Business assurance is basically saying, and you'll see there the first one under solutions is buy and sell, for instance. So if I am in practice with somebody else and I pass away, then life cover pays out, we structure it correctly so that there's no estate duty payable on that, and I can buy out my partner's shares. A lot of benefits on that. There's liquidity in the estate. We agree upon a share price and we know our new partner is going to be. So those are just some of those benefits. Now, there's a lot of other business assurance benefits so that you can get key person if somebody important passes away or gets disabled, for instance, then a sum of money can pay out. Contingent liability and credit loans all has to do with either money that you've borrowed from the bank or money that you've um, lent to your business. Because remember, when you pass away, the executives will say, we're calling in all debtors. So if you've put money into your business, please make sure that your business will have the liquidity to pay that. So all of these things become very important. So tonight, I mean, my business assurance lecture is a whole lecture on its own. And if you're interested in that, I'll be more than glad to come and speak to you about that. But just please understand that holistic financial planning, business assurance, is a critical part and so often overlooked part of, of proper financial planning. To make sure if you are, for instance, a medical professional, make sure that if you pass away your business and your partners and everything that goes with that is also properly taken care of. So please don't forget about this really, really important part of a list of financial planning. I'm not gonna talk about estate planning. I wanna get to this last person is the retired professional and um, what we do here is, is we do, typically for these people, we do post-retirement planning, 
and you'll see there at the top, it will say, do I have enough money for uh, capital to live the life I want to live? And often we hear these people, I had a, a meeting last week again with a client, said, I'm so concerned about the rising um, cost of medical expenses. All of you are in the medical field, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, at retirement, and we say, let's look at, at post-retirement planning. We see how much is possible. What is it that you can safely live off? How do you do this legacy planning? And how do we make sure that we cover all of your healthcare costs going forward? So I hope that what we've accomplished here tonight is, is to show you that holistic financial planning means that we look at you as a holistic person who's got different desires and needs, who's got complex, who's, who's a complex human being. And, and that is, there's got certain desires, certain things you want out of life, certain ways you want people to remember you. And that is why if I can leave you with one thing tonight, it is that first question there. What is it? How do you want to live? What is it that you want to take out of life? Go and write that down. There's a lot of value in that. I'm sure you know of the studies that's been done that proves that. What is it that you want from life? Go and sit down, write that down and say, how do I build financial planning, proper plan. And if you don't know how to do that on your own, go to a professional advisor or financial planner who can help you do that. And say, this is important. How do I put all these building blocks in place for me to live a life with peace of mind that I've got enough money to retire on and leave a legacy behind? So Dr. Faisal, that is everything from our side. There's so much more I can say, but we're going to cut ourselves short. You'll see there's some more information in the slide. You're more than welcome to go and read on that. And if you've got questions, please ask us. And if you want to get in contact with us, I'll be so happy to answer any questions if you want offline. Uh, my details, I'm sure, will be available through SADA. So, Dr. thank you very much for the opportunity. I, I, As you can see, I'm very passionate about this. I love it. And thank you so much for the opportunity to share a bit of what we are passionate about, me and Mochobi, um, and, and we are, that we've, we've made a difference even just in one person's life tonight. We start thinking differently about finances and financial discipline. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wainand and Mochobi, for the most informative uh, uh, last one hour. Um, you know, what, what, what uh, resonates with me is obviously the whole concept of the budget. And from personal perspective, I know so many people that don't live by budgets. I mean, they run every month with just money coming in and out. And uh, if, you, if you just realize what a simple document it is, um, and if you follow it diligently, it's amazing how you have control over your life and over your finances. So it's something that I would encourage everyone to, to take heed of um, and to make time for. Um, also, the, the Maslow hierarchy, um, I mean, your, your, your triangle, I mean, really puts things into perspective. So... So, so thank you for that. And the issue of the will, I mean, you showed a stat of 14% of people that have wills. So it's shocking. It means 86% uh, of people are going to have their money being managed by the state the day they're not around, uh, which, is, which is really unbelievable. Now, the thing is, we guys are dentists. We know how to fix teeth. So we rely on guys like you to educate us uh, on how to, to secure our hard earnings uh, uh, and obviously to leave that legacy. So some gems that you've put in here. I mean, in a one hour, we obviously can't um, cover everything, but I think you've, you've, you've put some gems in here that gives us things to think about. And also I've been doing a lot of thinking through your lecture to say that maybe in the new year, we need to develop a series of lectures, uh, just unpacking each topic that you spoke about so that we kind of have more insight into how to think about our financial affairs going forward. So, so really for me, from a personal perspective, it was, it was really amazing. You succinctly put it together. Uh, you guys did amazingly well. Thank you for that. Um, you. We've got an excellent turnout today, over 320 delegates. So clearly this topic is close to people's hearts. Uh, and obviously we can build on this. So that's what I'm looking forward to. We've got a few questions that I want to go through step by step. Uh, and then maybe you can answer each question as we go along. Uh, if you guys don't mind doing that. Yeah, absolutely. At the moment, we're sitting with 12 questions, but as we go along, uh, delegates will add more questions on. Uh, okay, so the first question. Let me just go to the top. Uh, can you post a budget template for us? Um, I just lost that there. 
Okay, so the first question is, can you post a budget template for us? So, um, Benan, do you have something that 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 uh, you can share with the delegates? Yes, I can even if you want share my own budget that I do that that also works quite nicely. So, yeah, I'm, I'll be more than happy to to share something like that. So, just remind us um, to share that with you. I'm I'm very very happy. The other thing is is that you must also go and check out, which is really cool, is this is very nice apps available that link stuff to your bank account the really fancy ones and as the stuff goes out it starts learning what goes where and then you allocate it on the app so you don't need something that complex but i know for a lot of people who don't want to use the excel spreadsheet it's really nice apps also available so um, you are you're welcome to go and check that out uh, as well okay so when I'm obviously a budget template i mean we can it's, it's as simple as, as simple as us googling it but i think uh, uh, we trust something coming from you. Sada posted in the chat that they would be able to send it out to all the delegates by tomorrow. So yeah. if you can share something uh, with us, then we'll share it with, with all the delegates that's on this okay. webinar tonight, right? Okay, the next one is more comment congratulating you for the addition to your family. So from all of us, once again, congratulations. And as Moshabi says, enjoy your two nights of sleep because uh, the first couple of days are rough thereafter, hey? <laughs> I, I feel everybody who tells me that didn't make this full disclosure when we had the choice to have a job. So yeah, I'll, I'll look into that. <laughs> Thank you. You know, Thank take you. it from my perspective, you'll go through it and it's such an awesome experience, even though you don't have so much of sleep that in a few years we'll plan another and another. So it's just part of life. You take it uh, as it comes, right? And you enjoy every step of the way. As Moshabi said, her son's now 14 years old. They grow so quickly. we got to appreciate every, every single moment uh, that you have. Uh, with them because they really do grow so quickly. Thank you so much for the well wishes. Okay, anonymous posted. Why do most of your schemes come to an end at the age of sixty, when many dentists work beyond seventy years of age, either because they are forced to work or work for the fun of dentistry? It's a worldwide phenomenon. So we also got this question a lot in the previous webinar that we've done, right? That PPS kind of has a cut off at, at the age of seventy and not beyond that. Can you maybe shed some, some light on that? I'll happily jump in there. Um, I need to know the details of that uh, because mm -hmm. our sickness benefit, which is our core product, which is supposed to protect you while you're working, that is a whole of life benefit. So as long as you're working, that benefit continues. And I remember, for example, when we, earlier this year, when we had a different project and we launched our financials, we had members as late as 82 stopping to work now in April at the age of 82. And how I remember that is because of obviously how we, how the profit share account itself works, et cetera. But they were accessing this for the first time at the age of 82 when they chose to retire. So we well aware that most of our professional members and actually most of other members, um, most people will not be able to afford to retire at 55. That used to be a dream of most of us when we were younger. That's the reality is very different. And for professionals and for professionals, especially who work for themselves, they work, they work well beyond that. And all our benefits cater for that. There is an option. So on some of the benefits, for example, life cover critical illness, even on the sickness benefit, you can choose a term that ends at 60. But that would have, we would hope is um, with discussions with your financial planner and there would have been a, a, quite a strong reason. So for example, let's say life cover. If I take out life cover now and I'm only gonna pay it for 20 years, or at least I take out a bond as well. At, um, and that bond, come say net bank or whatever bank needs surety on that bond, I might take out a life cover to cover the bond amount, which would become payable to my bank. And I might say, oh, you know what, because I've got all my other financial planning in place, I'm only gonna take this out for the 20 years while I, need, I owe my bank something. But all our plans have a whole of life option. So Sabi, just give me an idea, right? Um, say a person's earnings is 100%, right? 100% a month. What percentage of our earnings should we dedicate to, to investment, to risk, to insurances? I mean, how, how much should we have as discretionary income as a thumbsack? What should be our car repayment percentage of the thumbsack? Because I think where many people get lost is that pie is just is only so small, right? And how do you allocate that pie and, and live because ultimately you work hard the whole month and you got to live as well. You can't just be paying debit orders and, and all of these type of things, right? So is there kind of a, a, a benchmark, a thumbsack that we can follow 
to say that out of your budget, allocate so much towards this, allocate so much towards the bond. I know bond is generally 30%. That's what the bank uh, generally lend you money on. Um, but if you work out everything that you want to do, it becomes more than 100%, <laughs> which, which is a problem for most of us. I mean, we, we need some money to live as well. No, true. Um, do you perhaps have those percentages? Yeah. I, I might have uh, outdated figures I, here. I, yes, I am actually very much against giving that. I can remember when I just worked, I was very privileged to start working with one of the very famous investors in South Africa. If I mention his name, a lot of you will know him. Um, and he once had the same question from a client. And then he told the client, no, this uh, it's generic. I can't give you an answer on that because it comes back, Dr. See the thing that we said in terms of the pyramid, it comes back to what is it that you want from life? Do you want to make sure that for me, it's very important to know that my child is well taken care of, but for other people, that, that answer is, is, is different. And that is why we go. I'm so glad this question comes up. That is why we go to this wealth pyramid to say, how much do we do that? And you would have seen, I didn't draw a pie chart and said, allocate so much here, allocate so much here. My message is twofold. One, live within your means. Um, I yesterday had a very bad experience. I couldn't be in the theater with my wife when, when my baby was born. And I spoke to my father. I said to him, yes, it was such a bummer for me. I could see her luckily when she came out. But I couldn't be there. And then he told me, you know what? Unfortunately, his dad also told him, there's a big difference in life between what we want to do and what we can do. And often I tell people that when it comes to finances as well. We, I, I would love to go to America every year, but I can't do that because it's costing me money. Now, to your point, we also want to make sure, and you are 100% right there, we also need to live here and now. And I always tell people there's a fine balance between putting away money for your old age and also making sure that you're just enjoying your life whilst you are here as well. It also won't help if you put all your money away and then you never get to enjoy that. But what is that balance that differs from person to person? For some people, status and a very fancy car is very important. Others say, I just need something to get me to work. So once we have all those questions answered, and that's why I say, go and write down what is it that you want from life and then plan around that, your budget, and all of these things, build the pyramid within that framework. So I never, ever will you hear me. And some other people have got different views and that is fine. Um, I'll never say allocate so much percentage wise um, to your place. I go and say, what is it that you earn? What is it that you want to do for yourself and your children? And then you build it in that pyramid. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but that is how I think about it. Yeah, I think Wena, that was well answered. I think it puts into perspective what you just said. And I think it all comes down to the pyramid, hey? We've kind of need to relate our situation to the pyramid and come to us, come to a, a, a balance on how we're going to work that pyramid to our own individual uh, needs and wants. And, and, and just the last thing on that is, is that is why it's important because when you start out, you'll need a lot more insurance than you need, for instance, later in life, life coming yeah. because you've built up assets. Then that balance changes. So it also changes through your life stages and that's why mm -hmm. we use that. So it's also not the same in different parts of our life. And that is why it's so important to sit down and to also not just do this plan once, but to review it every year. Yeah. So like, to make sure that pie and that balance is always in place. So I guess that's why the financial planner is such an important part uh, in someone's financial health. Uh, because he or she would be able to do that on a yearly basis and guide you accordingly as you move through, throughout life. Correct. Good stuff. Okay, the next question. Why do you not talk about Bitcoin or real money uh, like gold? Should this not be part of one's portfolio? Yeah, so that's a very good question. We get a lot of questions on Bitcoin and so. So obviously tonight I haven't spoken about any asset classes. I've just mentioned that. So if you want, and to your point earlier, we can have a session where we specifically focus on investment. And, and then I can tell you about, you know, how equities work, how much should be onshore, offshore. And so that is like a whole lecture on its own. So very good question. Thank you for that. But we didn't tonight want to go into specific asset classes, how they perform, um, crypto, all of those things. That comes in when we're talking investment specific. So we would be more than happy to also have a session, maybe bring in PPSI on that as well, to specifically speak about that. I know um, I'm getting a lot of questions about the crypto and so for my own family. Um, and so and there's a lot of things that you need to consider. Crypto is actually much more complex than people realize. So yeah. because there's not just Bitcoin, there's a lot of different cryptos. 
it's going to be very complicated. So I don't want to, if we go down that rabbit hole, I can keep you busy for another whole evening, which we don't want to do. So yes, very so we'll reserve that for a specific topic then in the new year. If there's a need, which I think there is, then we're happy to um, address that as a specific topic. One. Perfect. Thank you. Next question. Why does PPS not have a funeral policy, a uh, cover policy for its members? We have to look at other insurers for this type of cover. I'll take that one. The big reason why we're not able to offer funeral cover or funeral policy is the, because of the structure of PPS. Because we are member owned and it is this actually very specific requirements as to who qualifies for PPS, which is your graduate professionals with at least an honors level um, type qualification, et cetera. Because we fall in that pool, there's certain legislation that says then, who are we allowed on? So the problem with the funeral cover is that, or not the problem, but the how funeral covers themselves generally work is that I would want to insure my spouse, I'd want to insure my kids, probably my grandma who brought me up, my uncle, et cetera. And the chances are that those members of my extended family might will not meet the primary reason of why PPS exists, which is to go through the eligibility process to have the basic degrees, et cetera, that PPS does require. And that is a requirement that does allow us to operate as a mutual company um, that is exclusive in this market. So that is the main reason. Having said that, for our PPS members themselves who do qualify, although we don't have a funeral policy per se, if you have life cover, if you have our life cover benefit, on that one, we do have, we don't call it a funeral benefit, we call it a, an immediate needs benefit, but that is a 50,000 cash lump sum that can get paid out to your beneficiaries within 48 hours of your death. And then obviously can cover stuff like funerals, if you need to, um, to have a funeral that happens quite quickly, or then whatever other immediate needs arise after a funeral. So that's how we try to protect our members, but we are limited uh, in terms of extending that beyond people who do qualify for membership. Thanks, Mosabi. Thanks for that. Okay, the next question. Why can't I just stop payments for endowment policies or retirement policies without getting the third degree if I'm struggling now? So I think this question kind of relates to the whole COVID challenge uh, and the penalties that insurers generally load on if someone wants to uh, put a hold or cancel their retirement endowment policies. Um, I guess from the member's perspective, an endowment policy is a discretionary policy. Why should there be a penalty or why should they be getting the third degree? Can you kind of shed some, some light on that? Yeah, so I'm going to give a generic answer on that. And then the member is more than welcome to contact me with more specific details and I'll try and assist the best that I can. Um, so the long story short, you get all the new generation policies, especially on retirement annuities. The old one was so you've contractually obliged, they paid the, the commission upfront to the advisor. That was kind of priced mm -hmm. in the escalation and the price and everything. So they can't get you out because they've already incurred costs. All generation, all the new generation retirement annuities, you can stop them. So don't let anybody tell you differently. If you've got a new generation product, you can stop it. End of story. Um, endowments, there's also, there's obviously a contract. There's a five year period, but in terms of monthly payment, there's also um, options, especially on the new generation products. So that you can stop. It's not something that you must do. So it's a good, it's a good thing um, with the new generation product. All generation products very different. So um, that's a generic answer. If you've got that, maybe um, often people just want you to continue paying because it's beneficial for them as well. But in the new generation products, you can actually stop them. That's my generic answer. If you want more specifically for me to have a look at that specifically, and it is at PPS, or if you just want an opinion, I can help you with that. Then I want to ask the member to just be in contact with me. Um, I'll gladly have a look at that and see if we can help. So yeah, um, pretty much that is the that is the structure of them. Um, if it is an old generation policy, unfortunately, it is so um, that, that there's already costs that the insurers has incurred. Um, luckily, we see very few of that these days. They're kind of um, starting to, to move through their shelf life. So, yeah, I, I hope that, that helps a bit. Ben, and thanks for clarifying that because we're probably going to get a few more questions along the same lines. Uh, but for the member that posted this question, please reach out. Uh, you can also email SADA and SADA will then forward uh, the inquiry or the or the um, or, or, or the issue to, to, to the appropriate people at PPS. Okay, PPS critical illness cover ends at 60. I will probably live up to 80 like many other dentists. Why stop at 60? Well, Shabi, I think you've, you've answered that quite nicely earlier on, hey? Yeah, it's exactly the same. 
cool stuff. Okay. Anonymous posted, I feel PPS has failed us with income protection during lockdown. I feel they should have paid a percentage to everyone during the time you could not work, not only if you were sick. I think you've kind of answered this, that PPS has paid over 100 million rand already towards PPS cover. I don't think it's practical to pay everyone. Uh, it, there's got to be a, a, a reason to pay. And I guess that's where the 100 million has gone. Eh? Yeah, and I think if we, I can maybe just add to that is if we look at income protection slash sickness benefits across South Africa and worldwide, mm. there is a sickness underpin to those benefits. So that in order for those claims to pay, then you need to have been sick. And why that is important to mention, which I know is a hard um, pill to swallow, uh, but why that is important to mention is we therefore price our policies based on the probabilities and the tables of how do you expect people to get ill, et cetera. So if we were to move out of that, it would become a bit tricky, especially then also the flip side, and we have had that as well in other sessions I've sat in, is on the other side are then those members who were not exposed to COVID, for example. They were staying at home, I'm working at home, I've been working, I haven't been to the office since lockdown. Um, and my argument as a PPS member could be, but now how are we paying this money that could have gone into my profit share when I'm healthy, I'm home, I'm safe, et cetera. And it's always that fine balance. So obviously realizing that we're not able to do that. And I think obviously look, lockdown, nobody planned for it. No government, no, 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 no nobody could plan for, for government, but the type of cover that would have paid under lockdown that normally falls under the short-term insurance structure as business interruption. So that's a whole other policy with its own types of things. And even so not all of them do cater for that, but that's another story for another day. What PPS then did, obviously realizing the financial troubles that most of our members did go through and the unexpected nature of this and just how hard lockdown has been on all of us is we did try accommodate members rather through premium support. So rather than paying out, signing a check to everybody, which was not gonna be sustainable or work, we did though then um, put in additional premium support measures in place for those members who really, really were tied. Uh, I mean, we even got as, I don't wanna say generous, but for example, we went extreme enough that for example, on our life cover benefit, and normally with life cover, if you don't pay and something happens to you, obviously you're not gonna get a payout. But we went as far as offering a relief where you, you could suspend your life cover premiums. And that if something had happened to you in that three months, you would have still paid your full life cover benefit. That is but one of the means that we had. Uh, the second one we had was to allow members to pay for their premiums using profit share. So I'm not paying anything from my bank account, but to keep our premiums active. Uh, if I've got a, a decent enough um, profit share balance, we can deduct premiums from that. And we have many members who took up that option. There was two variations of it. I'm not gonna go into that just now, but we had many members who took up those options just so that they can catch their breath a little bit. And, and that options, those options are still open, um, at least the, the paying from your profit share. So that is an option even today, if you feel that, you know what, I still haven't recovered as much as lockdown has eased, I still haven't recovered. I just need time to catch my breath. Those options are still available. And the last option is that members, you can miss up to two months of premiums and then go into an arrangement with PPS. So come we say, November is not looking good, December is not looking good. You can inform us and then we say, okay, no problem. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it's not a nice position to be in, but we can make plans to say, okay, you will then start paying from January, your January premium plus 10% until the two months or whatever is paid back. So that was our way of trying to assist members while retaining our book. Um, for the rest of all the other members. And remember for us as an insurance company, we have legislative requirements as well in terms of what we need to keep in reserves to be able to honor other types of future claims as well. So it's, it was that fine balance of saying, how do we support our members without then going against what is required? Um, legislative well, Sabi, thanks for that. Sada was also quite instrumental in negotiating uh, premium relief with PPS. Um, and also I guess, the decision making also comes down to how it affects other people's profit share account and also the whole concept of intergenerational fairness uh you can't you can't burden one generation because of another generation so i guess all of that uh, uh goes into the into the decision making process so that whatever happens is as fair as possible to everybody yeah. 
it's a tough balancing act, but um, mm. I think we did mm. try the best we could yes, under yes, the circumstances. I, I see that. I see that. And you are right. Okay. Sado was particularly involved with the second option of the profit share or paying profit, premiums yeah. to profit share, etc. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. At what age will PPS cover you in case of a disability? Disability. Remember what I said earlier on that we've got two types of disability. So your occupational disability which is linked to you doing your job, that does end at the age of 66 uh, because generally people stop working at 66. Um, what happens for people who don't stop working at 66 is that, that that benefit converts to a severe illness benefit, which is essentially a critical illness benefit. And then the other type of disability that I spoke about, the functional disability one, that goes on or it can go on if you choose that option for whole of life. Okay. Dr. Yusuf Vali asks, if I was already diagnosed with a stroke and claimed sickness benefits, are these products still available to me? I guess the remember, products that you that you spoke about, yeah. Yeah, remember with all the products, there is underwriting. So underwriting is we have a team of qualified people who say, okay, what are your medical specific to you? What are your specific medical conditions? So that's how we I'm sure you've seen our application form. It's quite a long one with a lot of medical questions because we try and understand what is your medical risk. Uh, we look at your family history, we look at yourself, and then depending on what you are applying for, some benefits might be able to issue despite the fact that you have had um, a stroke, for example, life cover that normally that has the least amount of, or the, the most lenient underwriting, if I can call it that. Whereas you might find with your sickness benefits, if you're applying for additional cover there, it could, uh, depending also on how have you recovered? What was your treatment? How long have you had this thing on? What's the prognosis? So they look at absolutely everything. So you will find that they'll probably ask for quite a lot of medical reports to get a really clear picture of where are you at with this condition that you have and then make a decision based on that. And the decision can go one of three ways. They can either give it to you what we call with standard terms. So meaning with, we give you cover as is with no term, what, what you saw in the quote, a hundred rand for a million rand cover as an example, that's what you're going to get. That's how much you're going to pay, happiness. The other option would be that they load you. So we say, okay, we willing to take you on. You are a slightly higher risk than Bob next door. So because you've had this medical history, we will give you the risk, but then we're going to charge you an extra premium for it. That could be 20%. It could be anything up to 100% of your premium. And then the last option would be to say, we, uh, they, they might actually even exclude that specific condition. So they might say, okay, we can still give you cover, but stroke in its entirety is um, excluded. So then you can claim for heart attack, you can claim for cancer and anything and anything else in between. So it would be quite specific to the individual and the information that's made available to us, the medical information that's made available. Okay, thank you for that. The next question by Anonymous is um, quite an interesting one. Uh, it goes, do I have to continue paying my premiums if I am disabled? Most of what you will be paying me monthly will go back to PPS premiums. Do you have a premium waiver to cover my monthly installments to PPS? If not, why do you not introduce something like that? Um, okay, I think we need to just be um, split out when we speak about disability. Um, disability does tend to be used interchangeably with permanent incapacity. So in the scenario that is painted there, um, it seems to be more like permanent incapacity. So this person has become now permanently incapacitated and they are now receiving an income from PPS. That one is a little bit tricky in the sense that we've got two benefit types at PPS. So it will depend on which platform, if I can call it that, you fall on. So if you took out your sickness benefits at PPS before March, 2015, then you would fall on the old platform and members on that platform have an option of either continuing to work. So obviously it depends if it's a partial disability, so we, we, you, you can still do something. Um, then you have an option to continue working, continue paying premiums, and then you're able to claim for unrelated illnesses. Or the other option is to not pay premiums. So you're still in receipt of your income, but then you don't pay premiums, but then what that would mean that then you can't claim for unrelated conditions. So that's the, option before 2015, like I said, if you, if you bought your benefits before March 2015. If you bought your sickness benefits post March 2015, it then when you go into PI slash disability, your premiums are waived. So you get an income from PPS and you don't pay a premium, but then again, because your premiums are waived, you can't claim for 
any other unrelated sickness benefit. Unless if, um, if I have to think of a quick example, can we say your disability is because, or your PI, your permanent capacity is because of cancer, really call it quite um, advanced stage cancer, but you still awarded, can we say a 60% PI or disability benefit. Um, and lo and behold, one sweet day you drive into the shop to get your essentials, you're in an accident and that, that keeps you in ICU out of action completely for three months. Then for that three months, we would review your payment upwards to 100%. We would treat it now as a sickness benefit for that duration until you've recovered and then we revert back to what was the cause of your disability and what were you getting paid for for that. Okay, so I'm gonna make a confession at this point, right? All of these rules and pre-2015 and old product and new product is becoming a bit confusing for me, right? And I'm sure it's becoming confusing what for the members out there, right? It mm -hmm. kind of reminds me of what the medical aids do to us with all their different rules and exclusions and all of these things. Now, in the most simplest terms, how, how, how can we engage between SADA and PPS that we're getting the best advice for our members in the most simplest way possible, right? So if we have a problem at some stage, then then it's it's easy to sort out, it's easy to fix. Uh, when life is complicated as it is, and now to remember PI and 80%, and you know, uh, unless it's a bit, unless it's too late already, but I, I, I think it's going above over our heads. So maybe what we need to think about is just giving us some comfort, right, on how SADA and PPS can collaborate much more strategically uh, to alleviate these type of of of, of concerns yeah. from our members' minds, right? So, so I think something that we need to work on, right? You guys know it because you're in the trade, right? Yeah. Uh, but for us guys, it's 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 a it's a it's a bit too much to it's swallow. I think uh, it's a lot. To, mm. It's a lot to swallow. Mm. Uh, anyway, the next question is also a very interesting one by Dr. Norman Clement. He says, "Thank you, but I see many of my dental and physician friends the impact of divorce." Should I have in my plan a clause that includes divorce and how do I go about it? Yeah, so I also read that and that is a very interesting question. I don't know what clause you would have in, in your plan, but what you can do um, when it comes to divorce, and I'm actually, I've had more than one client who's, who's either been divorced or might go through a divorce. Now that becomes very, very tricky. So. So um, the first thing is, is, if you've gone through the unfortunate event and very traumatic event, which is a divorce, then I would suggest you go and sit down. So let's say you've been divorced. That has happened now. I'll get back to pre that. Um, just now. Um, go and sit down beside you and say, let's start from scratch and we make sure that I plan because um, different marital regimes can have different effects. So I've seen a lot of people who's lost a lot through divorces. It's not always as clean cut as just the numbers that we have that see in front of us. Um, a lot of things that the court can take into consideration. And so so um, with that, once you know what the numbers are, go and sit down and start planning as quickly as you can again. Um, and then also a lot of other things like updating your will and so it becomes very really important. Okay. So because if you divorce for a certain period of time, the, the executives will see, okay, but um, it's, let's say your spouse was, was still going to inherit and they say through the trauma, you didn't change your will, but then after three or four months, I can't remember the exact same number, then it goes back. So if your spouse is still on your will, for instance, then you have to change that. Otherwise they'll inherit. And obviously if you divorce in most cases, you don't want that. So a lot of things like that, that you need to take into consideration. Pre-divorce, if somebody is saying, I might get divorced or I might not have had this as well with clients, that's quite difficult. So what we do then is we go back to, to try and test the financial planning principle. So, so we always joke and we say, we're going to virtually kill you off when we do your financial plan. We'll say, if you pass away, like Michabi said, if you pass away today, how will your life look out your year? What will happen to your dependents? Is there enough money? If you had to retire today or we put a peg in the ground, how will your life look then? So that's the basic financial principles. To say, let's imagine this event happens now. We treat divorce, or I at least treat divorce in the same way and say, Right, if you should get divorced today, how will your life look very different then? And then, like I said, a lot of things become important, like your will, your marital regime. So if you're married in community of property, each take off of the other um, asset. Um, if there's a cruel or things like that, um, so you're married with the, with the um, 
anti-nuptial contract, then we have to take that into consideration. It, I must say it becomes very difficult and very iffy because especially if you don't do planning for husband and wife together and you don't have the spouse's assets, it could become very difficult to, to do that planning. So we work with the light, our availability, I always like to say, with what we can see now. And then the basic principle is, is let's say, we'll say, if you get divorced, this is what the picture looks like. So obviously, I, I maybe encourage somebody to do that. But if you, unfortunately, as part of your life, if, if that life event is likely to happen or, or might happen, then we will do the same thing and say, let's put ourselves in that situation. What will the picture look like? So yeah, that is, that is uh, pretty much how you have, have to deal with that. Say, if that should happen, how will my life then look? Um, not a lot more than that you can do. So Venant, how, how, how would divorce affect the profit share? I mean, profit share you can access at the age of 60, right? Say you get divorced at the age of 50, there's another 10 years to go before you can access your profit share. Does, does, does that divorce have an impact on the profit share account by any chance? Maybe Mutshabi can help us with that. Okay. Sure. Um, no. The short answer is no. Um, profit share, our contract is with the member. So the person who belongs to PPS is, is a member, is contributing. That's our only contract. So we don't get involved in divorce arrangements. What I have, however, seen is some members in their divorce agreement make agree together that when the profit share becomes accessible at age 60, then the member will share X percent with that with the um, ex-spouse. But like I said, we don't get involved with that at all. They send us the divorce agreements all the time. We like, sorry for you, we'll keep that on file. At the age of 60 or when the member chooses to access their profit share, we still pay directly to the member only because our contract is with the member. Obviously, then it is up to him or her to meet their end of the deal in terms of what is agreed to in the agreement, divorce agreement. Okay. So for Dr. Clement, I'm suspecting he's sitting with a big profit share account and I think we've given him some tips on what to do going forward. Eh? <laughs> okay. The next one by Dr. Minoli Pillay. Thank you, Sada and PPS, for an extremely informative evening. I personally would like to know more about trusts, business assurance, and estate planning, if PPS would be keen to elaborate on those in future webinar, so it can be discussed privately with a broker. So I think that's what we need to do. We need to focus on these topics for the future and give the member enough information to be able to go back to their brokers and, and, and kind of probe and question their brokers to give them the best financial advice. So I think we'll structure it along those lines if you guys are okay with that. Mm. Okay, anonymous. Uh, I just wanted to add to your earlier point, uh, Dr. Faisal, that sure. the importance of the broker cannot be underestimated. Mm. And mm. I think the best relationship or the best thing you can do for yourself is to have a relationship, a good relationship with your broker, but also an informed relationship with your broker. And yes. where we need to come in is informing you the member because we also do have a lot of broker sessions obviously but yeah. the push also needs to come from the member side where i've now read this i understand this now i'm approaching you the broker because i think at the moment the current situation is still the push from the broker's end and yes. we need yes. an yes. well-informed and educated member consumer. yeah consumer. that's how 100%. the market is moving and we're happy to play that role totally agree yeah. totally agree um, Ultimately, uh, can I also just add to that? So, so we, so my team, for instance, don't implement. We work with advisors. So, if you want to get in contact with me, and I'll refer you to somebody in my team because my expertise is more in, um, in, in, in investments. But I can get somebody in my team to help you. If you've got your own advisor, we are happy to work with your advisor. And if there needs to be any sort of implementation, they will do that. We're not in competition with the brokers. My team actually works with the external guys to help. So, you welcome to. If you want to get in contact with me via Sada um, and say, I want somebody to help me with this. Um, and, and if you don't have an advisor, we can refer you to one. We still then don't do it on our own. But we can sit down with you and talk you through all the technical things um, if that is a need of you. So, so like Michelle, we said, very, very important for us. We treasure our advisors who put business with us. We work with them. That is why the specialist team is there. Um, so if you want to, doctor, sit down with somebody in my team to take you through that um, and, and we, if you've got an advisor, take that back to them or even sit with us in the same meeting. That's also cool with us. So then you are more than welcome. Get in contact with me. Um, we will be glad to help you um, with that on one-on-one -on -one session. But yes, we can also do a, a webinar on that. 
um, I'll get somebody who's much smarter than me in that um, specific area in for that session. But yeah, we, we get a lot of questions, especially on business insurance and trust um, these days. So we, we, we'll be glad to answer that. Thanks, Maynard. Okay, the next one by Anonymous. My mother is dependent upon me for her upkeep. Why can't I add her to my medical aid as a dependent? Um, it falls so, uh, in the prof med I space. I, I, yeah, I think we need to get one of the prof med guys to answer that question. That is more in the medical aid space. So yeah, we need to, my knowledge of that um, might be somewhat outdated. So I'd prefer not to give wrong okay. information, but again, you can send us the details and we'll get it through to the right people in prof med. Sure. So, so for that member, if we can say, if you can send through your details, we'll get prof med to give us an answer on that. Okay, Anonymous posted, why are we not able to boost our life insurance so that our life cover becomes paid up at a certain retirement age, so we still have the benefit till we die. It will be easy to pay this while we are still working. Mm. Sure. I'm we actually used to have those types of policies a long time ago, and that came under pressure. Um, mm. <laughs> we used to call them universal type policies. Um, this is probably up until mid 90s there they about um and nobody was happy with those and how they performed and in terms of what then people expected to get in investments versus how much their lump sum payment would have been etc and when treasury national treasury actually started reforming the insurance industry that was one of the first policies that they said maybe relook this so um yeah it's a bit interesting to see that there's a request for that to come back mm. i don't know if there's anything else there Vayna, that you want to add that's my so I guess last memory of compliant. those policies I, i'm not an expert in embarrassed products per se so i'd rather not venture onto this so i guess it's more compliance uh, uh, uh situation that pps has adopted right um anonymous should i wait for the markets to improve before accessing my retirement fund benefits i would think so hey if the <laughs> member can do without cashing out now, we should wait until the markets pick up and cash out at a much later stage, eh? Yeah, so so there's a long and a short answer. I'm going to give you the short one once again, rather get in contact with me or another professional to give you a specific answer. So um, the JSE has made back all the gains he's got this year so far, in this week goes now far. So on, on Joe Biden, the markets reacted very positively. Okay, having said that, my question is, is where have the markets recovered? At what point in time will we say we are now happy that the markets have grown? So there's a lot of studies that have shown that um, in behavioral finance, and you'll see a lot of the books here in my shelf actually goes about that. Where, where will we be at? Okay, the reality is, is um, American markets are fantastic at the moment. If you invested there, you have really got some nice returns, but they're fully valued. So where do you cash out? The reality is, is people don't cash out when the markets are full, uh, overpriced because they're scared they're missing out. So what is the two big things that drive investments? It's greed and fear. So we cash out when it's low because we're scared that the markets are going to fall further. And we, we, we don't cash out when it's expensive because it, we're scared that we're going to miss out on the growth. The question is, is your retirement fund benefit is not once off the thing that you're probably going to take now. It's either going to be a retirement annuity that you're going to start, um, that you're going to convert, let's say, to a living annuity or to a guaranteed income um, and that you're going to start living off of or it's discretionary money that you live off monthly. So the point is, is there's not a one question also to say, wait for the markets to recover. I mean, everybody would want to cash in when the market is at their highest. Where is that? Well, I don't know. People often ask, when must we cash out? I say, you know, if I had that crystal ball, I wouldn't be working for PPS um, because then I would just be trading my own money. So what I can tell you is, is that um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, so the, the full this year and this calendar year, JSE has actually grown back. Um, so that might be one answer. The other answer is, is um, we, we don't want you to say we're trying to time it. We're very much against that because nobody knows what's going to happen. Rather structure a proper plan. Say, this is how much money I have now. This is how much I need every month. Structure a plan to take um, it's so much money so that you're not eating into your capital. A planner will be able to help you with that. And also, they make sure that it's in invested in the right asset classes. So, so I'm assuming everything is not invested in equity. So there's a lot of things that you have to take into consideration. It's not a wait for the best possible time and then climb up. It's much more complex than that. So rather get to somebody who can help you with that. But I hope just my general comments maybe have just given you a bit of guidance and one or two things to maybe think about. 
Thanks. The next one is more comment. Discovery paid nothing at all during COVID. PPS, PPS is so much better. So hats off to you guys. Hey, PPS is so much better. <laughs> okay. Anonymous posted, if I work in UK and South Africa, will I, will I be covered by my South African PPS policy or should I get PPS covered in the UK as well? I'm not aware that PPS is available in the UK. I know PPS is available in Australia and South Africa and Namibia. And from what I understand, PPS also covers expats. So, so I think the South African policy would cover someone working in the UK. Hmm? You have it 110%, Dr. Faisal. Um, you have a policy in South Africa, which you yeah. need to take out while you are in South Africa. But thereafter, wherever you move to, you will still enjoy the same level of cover. Um, like I do so pay yeah. attention. The, huh? I do pay attention the board meetings, eh? I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> you said it almost like I would have said it. You probably said it better than I would. So yeah. <laughs> okay. If your medical history has changed, when should you inform PPS? Will your premiums change if you develop, for example, hypertension? I think um, this is a prof made. I think this is a prof made qu a query no. as well. No. No, it's also applicable in on the insurance space, the life risk insurance space. You only ever need to tell us of a health, a change in health rather, when you apply for additional business. So if you took, took out new business beginning of this year and your health was 110% and something went horribly wrong this year, you don't need to tell us. The only other time you would need to tell us is now when you want to increase your cover. So can we say you have that moment that um, Benant had earlier some nine months ago when he discovered that he they are pregnant and he thought I now need to increase my life cover etc at that point when you fill in the application form you need to fill it in obviously with the latest information okay uh, anonymous post what happens when I've been covered for disability then not claim after motor vehicle accident hospitalization four months on I struggle paying the premiums when I finally start again with my cover, I'm told I won't be covered for the hand that broke and had an op despite having had cover when the accident happened. So I guess the the the, the member didn't put in a claim as when the accident happened, tried to put in a claim a few months later and was told that they should have, I'm told I won't be covered for the hand that broke despite having the cover when the accident happened. Is there a time limit to when we can put a claim in? Um, look, the policy contract says you have a period of six months to put in a claim, and we obviously advise members to do it in that time frame. Having said that, there are instances where it is impossible, virtually impossible for members to put in their claim in that time frame for whatever reason. You could be in ICU yeah. for six months. You could have had amnesia immediately after the illness. Um, so we are, as much as the contract itself does say six months, I know of cases, actually, uh, I, I probably shouldn't say how long that time was, but I do know of cases where we paid well beyond the six months we received the first claim then. So I think obviously if you come in with the motivation, with the reasons why you were not able to submit it timelessly, they will, we do consider that. Okay, so I guess a, the member will have to contact SADA for us to forward it on to you guys and then we can assist accordingly. Yeah, and to get the details, I think we need more detail, but yeah. that's the general yeah. rule is the six okay. months. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, Anur Shumf is asked if a recording will be made available. Yes, it will be on Facebook uh, and, and the various SADA platforms. He also asked, it appears that the longer you have been a member of PPS, the more PPS is penalizing you. I guess that has to be kind of put into perspective. I'm, I'm not too sure about that. I mean, uh, so I guess he needs to give us a bit more input on that for, for us to answer mm -hmm. appropriately. Right. Uh, Dr. Charles Geffen, I've requested a personal meeting to navigate cover. Email two time consuming, been contacted once a week after request two weeks ago and ignored since. Would like to simplify everything. Insurance are a profit share. So I think, Wayne, maybe someone from your team needs to get in touch with uh, Dr. Charles Geffen and help him simplify his affairs, huh? Would yeah, you be able to uh, do that? I'm, yeah, I'm more than happy to do that. I mean, I don't know who's been in contact with or who's. Um... Uh, who's been allocating in PPS, but I will suggest that maybe um, get in contact with somebody in my team. So yeah, if, if he wants us to do that and we've got his details, I'm more than happy to have one of the people in my team contact him. Um, yeah, what they need is help him and then also um, referring to somebody who can help them with the implementation if there is a need. 
but yeah, simplifying your, your structure, I'm a big fan of that. So you know, um, getting in, everything in one place with one plan. So we will gladly help that uh, the doctor with that. So yeah, let's let's we will be in contact. Um, something from my team, so we can do that. I'll just make a note here. So Thank you. Get this in. Okay, Doctor Marga, why is depression not included in dread disease? Mochabi, would you like to answer that? Depression I'm and thinking. dread disease. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm firstly trying to go through my list of conditions that are covered. Um, uh. Sure, for, for critical illness, for dread disease, oh, that is critical illness. Um, I'm going to need to think about this and you want to move on. Just I need to just okay, recall yeah, we'll some sure. old information and then I'll, I'll give you an answer before we finish. No problem. Uh, anonymous, on my PPS indemnity application, I have made a silly mistake. I have not indicated that I use local anesthetic which is not possible when you are a dentist. Will common sense prevail or will I be penalized for not indicating that I use it? I mean, every dentist uses local anesthetic. How do you use that local anesthetic? So I'm, I'm... No, this is what we use on patients. Now, I don't know whether anonymous uses local anesthetic on themselves. That's what or... I'm trying to understand as well. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, so anonymous, if you can kind of add to this uh, and give us more perspective, we'll be able to give you an answer. The next one, does my choice of beneficiaries on my PPS life cover supersede what is written in my will or if I die interstate? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we actually advise people to complete a nomination of beneficiary because on life cover, that will always, whatever you've said to the insurance company, in this case, PPS, that'll supersede. That is what will honor. Okay. If you don't give us a list of, or you don't complete the nomination of beneficiary form, then we we have to follow what's in the world, which does delay the process as well. So yes, so, it does supersede it. Yeah, and, and the important thing on that is, is make sure you've got beneficiaries because it pays out directly to them. So it doesn't have to go into the estate. If it goes into the estate, then you will pay um, uh, the, your executor's fees on that. Yeah. I mean, on 10 million, that is uh, 400,000 rand. I mean, it's a lot of money. So make sure, make sure that you, you've got those beneficiaries nominated. And also so that it doesn't get stuck in the world. Some some wills we're sitting with a family member now, they they estate, small estate, not even a big complex thing. There's one issue almost two years now that we still haven't been able to resolve that. So please make sure that you that you have beneficiaries on your policies so that it goes to that person directly and that you can bypass the executive fee on that. Um it's it's really important. Okay. Dr. Bestie Lowe asks. PPS has excluded my spine from my disability sickness benefits because of osteoarthritis. I joined PPS in 1985, young and healthy, but when I was diagnosed with osteoarthritis, lumbar vertebrae affected, they excluded my whole spine. Back problems are experienced by most dentists due to position we work in. I do not understand why they exclude my spine. It is indeed a common problem amongst dentists. This is also a similar problem that I had where when I had a back problem, I saw there was an exclusion. When I took my 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 um, policy whilst I was still in final year, so I think we need to look at this because I don't know if PPS has been excluding spine for dentists because not all dentists develop back problems, but it is a problem uh, in the industry. So I, I think there's something that we need to look at because I can I can relate to what Dr. Bestie Lowe is saying. I had a similar experience with PPS, um, and I'm busy reviewing why that's happened. Uh, yeah. So I just need to see whether it's throughout the industry or whether it was something specific from 1985. Um, if I can maybe just come in there with, uh, again, a very general comment is we don't have a general exclusion. For mm -hmm. example, a certain occupation. So we don't mm -hmm. have a blanket exclusion to say all dentists by default will get a spinal exclusion. That definitely yeah. doesn't exist. Like yeah. I explained earlier about how underwriting itself works. We look at each individual person. So for this doctor um, and how exclusions work would be based on the cover that you apply for at that time. So whatever cover he applied for in 1980 something when he was young and healthy and before he developed problems with his spine, that tranche of cover would be without the exclusion. So meaning that he should be able to, if he um, experiences spinal problems and that does keep him off work, he would qualify for some level of payment. I understand it would not be the same 
level of payment as to what his income is now and what he is insured for now, but we don't exclude, firstly, we don't exclude retrospectively. So at the time when he applied for additional business and there had not been a change in his health condition from that point onwards and for that amount of cover or that new bit of cover, that's where the exclusion would apply. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, anonymous. Said, there's no general exclusion, um, not for any occupation. That, that makes sense to me, right? But as I'm saying, I can relate to it because I had a similar uh, uh, situation which I'm, which I'm looking into. Uh, so I know what he's saying is not kind of off the mark because I'm talking from personal, but also get what you're saying because they can't be general. You can't, we can't generalize that every dentist is going to end up with a back problem. So, mm -hmm. so it's something that, that I'll also take up because I could look at my own policy. Okay, Anonymous asks, and we had a similar question in the previous webinar. I've had more than five PPS brokers in just so many years. They seem to leave PPS to join bigger companies. They would then approach me to sell me products from other insurers. Can I work with your head office directly? And I, the answer to that is definitely, uh, you can work through SADA. SADA has a strategic relationship with PPS. So with pleasure, you can deal directly with SADA PPS, right? Uh, Dr. Mark Gilman, can't the but question- I think, that sorry, is, also if I can come in there, Dr. Faisal, um, I suppose maybe just it's important for people to understand the differences between a tied agent. So, uh, we've got advisors who work for PPS and if those advisors leave, so they can obviously only deal with PPS and we do have a plan in place. So if those advisors leave, um, which I suppose people are entitled to, we then are able to allocate it to somebody who is within PPS. With independent advisors, obviously those, those don't work for PPS and it is it would be a bit more difficult to control their book, et cetera. But having said that, we also do know very strong relationships that members have with both tied agents or internal advisors and external advisors. So I think relationship building and trust building with your advisor is absolutely paramount. And I would say if on the first appointment you are not feeling or sensing this person, then that maybe is a sign for you that let me rather go try somewhere else. And then just the last point, and I think Vaynant would be too um, modest to mention it himself, is they do work with a lot of advisors, both internal and external. But the nicest thing about the um, specialist, uh, specialist support service uh, business at PPS is that they really are product agnostic. So they're not gonna push you, you're not gonna feel the strong push for a product. They look mm -hmm. at overall financial planning, they will show you where the gaps are, and then they will also even then facilitate that if you need to be in touch with an advisor who would that advisor be, et cetera. So that, that for me is probably the safest place to start the whole conversation, to uh, uncomplicate all of those many things that we've spoken about today. And hopefully with that strong foundation and that strong understanding, it can only lead to better relationships then when it does go into the advisor space. Yeah, and, and sometimes it unfortunately happens, but when a uh, when client views with us, we help, like I say, we don't implement, um, we will refer you then definitely to somebody you know has been around at PPS for a long time and planning to stick there or, or some of the external places feel more comfortable with that. So yeah, we, we can also um, help you if you want to get in contact with me just to refer you to somebody who's at PPS because you can deal with this directly, but it's better rather get somebody who can do a proper plan for you um, and can help you with all these things you spoke about. And, and if you want to get in touch with me just to help you get in touch with somebody who's going to probably stay at PPS a bit longer, who's been here for a while, and then I'm more than happy to also help you with that. Thank you for that. And then, Doctor, if I can just come in here with your earlier question, I do always say I hate unsolved mysteries. So the question about critical illness and why that is not covered under depression. Um, I think if you look at the, and this is, a, again, an issue in South Africa, I haven't researched yet what happens worldwide, is the definition of a critical illness. If you look at what the definition of that is, or severe illness, uh, depression and emotional uh, uh, psychological disorders don't fall into that yet. Having said that, I know that there is a lot of work happening behind the scenes with uh, across the industry in terms of how psychiatric and psychological conditions are treated as a whole by the insurance industry. And I think just with the whole um, psychological impact and destigmatizing um, psychiatric conditions, psychological conditions, etc. That is, uh, I, I dare say, that it's a future development. Unfortunately, though, that future is not tomorrow, definitely not next year, but that is stuff that is under consideration just in terms of how do we treat um, 
depression, psychiatric, um, psychological disorders as a whole. And that is the whole industry as a whole is looking at that. So crossing our fingers that in a few years time we will have, uh, we will meet or at least we'll rise to that occasion. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Tipesh Morar, Tipesh, how you haven't seen you for a long time. Okay, he says, I, if you had surgery, who decides how long you are booked off for? Can you request longer time if it hinders your work? I guess the surgeon will be able to advise how long, what's reasonable. Um, and, if, and if the colleague needs more time off for a specific reason because he hasn't healed, I'm sure the treating practitioner would be able to, to advise on that. Does PPS have kind of a guideline or they go purely on what the practitioner advises? Look, we do have what we call terminology has not just left my, um, as you were talking, I had it. Um, mm -hmm. But we do have guidelines in terms of what is the average number of days off for specific conditions. So, for example, a cesarean section, uh, at my last count, we know that females would be off or the mother would be off for six weeks. That is more or less the average. But okay. we also know that some people do, there could be complications, people might take slightly longer to recover for whatever reason, that then it is incumbent on the treating doctor to then give us that information and say, I have booked Mutabi off for eight weeks, not the six weeks, because of Mutabi's underlying conditions, X, Y, and Z. And based on that, we would pay the claim. So we have the average number of days that we work on, but we do take guidance because we do trust that the doctor sees this person. Average is average because it's across a whole lot of people, but individuals are individuals and we have to treat them that way. Yes, thank you. Okay, the last question for the evening. Um, I guess it's a follow-up from one of the previous questions. It's also by Anonymous. How soon will my beneficiaries be paid out for my life cover on my passing? Will my beneficiaries be taxed on the payout? Will the PPS payout be dependent on my estate being wound up? Okay, a nice simple one to round off today. How soon? That depends on how quickly we're able to get information out from the beneficiaries or from whoever is um, looking after your affairs. We've seen cases where we've paid within a month. Um, equally so, I've seen cases where we, it, 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 it can go on for six months, 12 months, etc. And again, I think the main thing again is having the conversations with your family, them knowing where to find what when things go horribly wrong. Um, for some odd reason, people are scared to say where their money is, um, or that we don't have those conversations easily. So imagine a spouse first even struggling to say, where do they even have cover? Where do they have policies? Which company do I go for? Uh, do I go to, to get this information? That's the first thing. The most important thing which you have mentioned is obviously make sure you have those beneficiaries and then those beneficiaries, like I say, inform them, but also make sure that they have the right documentation, that they have an ID number because we do require that. By law, without that ID number, we can't pay, et cetera. Mm. That they have a bank account or can open up one very quickly, et cetera. So we have a list of requirements. Um, I mean, just when I gave the COVID claim examples, we've started to see, unfortunately, death claims that have come in in the month of September and October. Up until then, it was just income um, benefits. But September, October, we've started seeing um, death claims come in and there's some we were able to pay very quickly within the month we were able to pay them because we received everything so just keep that in mind and have the conversations let your family know where to go um, the estate thing no like I said earlier on that if you've nominated beneficiaries we then pay directly to your beneficiaries so we bypass that we bypass estate duty it is all legal so um, we not we will not encourage illegal behavior and like I said it can be quite a smooth process and then there was a third part to your question, which I can't remember now. It's on the, it's on the tax, so I'll take that one. Um, okay. So they're asking if the beneficiaries will be taxed. So remember, your beneficiary will not be taxed. Okay. So, so that is important, but it's a deemed asset in your estate. So from a estate duty perspective, it will be included in your estate. Um, if it goes to your spouse, there will be no um, estate duty payable because then it kicks in that full Q um, uh, um, relief that so so between spouses there's nothing but if it's for instance goes to your children so your children will not on the on the money that PPS pays up I mean they will not be they will not be taxed on that in their hands completely tax free but your estate will be taxed on that I mean all the estate taxes um, uh, uh, kicks in so very important that is why financial planning is so important so 
obviously, if you if there is a 10 milliamp payout and there is uh, if you over the um, 25 milliamp or over the 20 million or over the let's start with the with the three and a half milliamp threshold um, and it goes to your children, then all of a sudden there will be estate duty payable on that that your estate will have to stand good for. That's why we always say make sure and um, that is um, shall be touched on that earlier. Make sure there's enough liquidity in your estate. There's a lot of expenses, all your debt, estate taxes, capital gains taxes, a lot of taxes and stuff that goes into your estate. And that is why we say make sure. And, and what we can even do, which shall be that we've, that, we, that we've done, and Dr. Fader, that we've done, is, is we say structure your policy so that a percentage goes to your beneficiaries directly and a part of that goes into your, into your estate so that it, that it um, covers those costs. So obviously then um, executive fees starts coming in, becomes very complex. We, we've got specialists who, uh, who specialize only in estate planning for our clients for this very reason. So short answer, tax in their hands, no, but remember it's a deemed asset unless it goes to your spouse, it goes to your kids, anybody else pays off debt, then it's a deemed asset in your estate. And then um, they, they, they might be, they're not always, but over a certain limit, there might be estate taxes payable. That is why it's very important to make sure when you take out my study, that you do a proper um, estate plan so that you can know that your liquidity is fine. Um, otherwise, then you start running into issues where they have to sell assets and say you don't want to do that. So, so get, a, get a professional who can help you structure it correctly. So I'm, I, I hope that has answered the question on the tax. Wenan, you know, the way, the way the questions have been coming in and the way you guys have been answering, it's, it's, it's become an eye-opener for me myself, and I guess it's become an eye-opener for many of the colleagues out there. Uh, we, 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 don't, we don't consider in your estate plan to have enough for liquidity because of all of those hidden costs, you know? And the last thing you want is for your, for your uh, uh, kids or your, or your wife or your spouse to be selling assets in, in, in time of grief, you know, because then they can be taken advantage of also in, in them selling those assets. So I think it's so, so important that there has to be an allocation for, for, for costs and allocation on what they left with. So coming to a life policy, just a question from my side, what if your family trust is a beneficiary of your life policy and your children are the beneficiaries of your family trust? Yeah, so, so what is your question specifically on that? So if you your, family so, so the, your family trust will get paid out the insurance, right? but then your beneficiaries would ultimately be the beneficiaries of that money. So it would be tax-free in their hands. Yeah, I remember then the conduit principle kicks in. So it goes to the, uh, to the trust and then it's in the trust. And then from there, if it flows through the benefits from that to your children, obviously in that year, then there's no tax. But if it's retained in the trust, then there will be taxes on that. So then all of, and that becomes really te technical. I don't even want to go down that route tonight. Mm. Um, be, but but remember, if it's once it's in the trust and it pays out to beneficiaries, then all the the tax rules um, as far as it pertains to your trust, then mm. kicks in. Um, exactly. And that is also very important. There, there was at some stage it was great to have a trust. So I just clamped down on a lot of those things. So 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 trust is is still good vehicles to use for the right things. Just make sure um, you don't have a family trust and you don't understand how the taxes and the costs of that work. So before you make anything to go into your family trust, rather make sure that your planning is done properly, that you understand the taxes and the consequences and how the trust is managed. Use the trustees. That also has a big influence on that. Um, and then also think about if you don't have a trust, because it's very important if minor children has to inherit, it. Make sure there's either a trust or a, 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 a um, testamentary trust. So for us now with the baby, there's a testamentary trust. If we pass away simultaneously, all goes into a trust for her to pay out um, for her life to, to make sure that she's she's taken care of. And then it will pay out the lump sum um, when she's 25. So so make sure because otherwise that money will go to the um, to the guardians fund at the, at the government, which you don't want. So so Dr. Faisal, on your question around family trust, remember once it plays into the family trust, then the trust tax rules kick in and they'll mm -hmm. take it there. So, so that becomes a whole can of worms on its own. So rather make sure if you're going that route that you've done proper planning and understand all the costs and the, the taxes payable. So basically when it comes to money affairs, it's challenging making money and it's challenging keeping money as well. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. like, and, and that is why that is why good planning is so important. There's, there's mm. all the aspects that you have to take in consideration. If you've got a good planner, 
a good advisor who doesn't just try and sell your product. Um, mm. if, if that takes all of this into consideration. You should have mm. peace of mind. And, and the reality for me always, um, mm. to, your, to your point, it's so hard. We work so hard to earn money. Make sure that it's tax efficient, that the government takes the right amount, but not more. Make sure that it's structured properly, that it's invested properly. You don't want your hard-earned money to go to waste. Or you do all of that and you don't have a will, or there's not a testamentary trust, and all of your stuff goes to the guardians fund for the government to make. I mean, make sure that you that you think of all these things. Rather, get to somebody who can look at your life holistically. And if you're uh, that uh, advisor is not doing that often, to please look at everything um, to make sure that all of these different aspects are, are in place. Okay. So one final question, and this is it, and we're closing shop, right? In the event of death, what happens to your profit share? I'll take that one. Um, it pays out to your beneficiaries. And hence, on our beneficiary nomination form, we also have four profit shares. So we split, split it per product. So, for example, if you have multiple life, product, um, life death benefits, you can um, nominate different people. And there's also a little section there, what should we do with your profit share? So that pays out to your beneficiaries. And um, yeah, so even if you pass away during the year, as much as we do declare profits only at the end of the year, if you pass away during the year, we then pro rata it for up until November, for example, et cetera. So that's money for your family as well. We don't keep it at all. I mean, if I remember correctly, last year, we paid about 86 million rand in profit share for members who had passed away last year. Motsabi, Wainan, thank you so much for your time this evening. It's quite obvious that your knowledge is deep in the industry, and I guess the members uh, would have benefited from that over the last uh, hour and a half or so. So so really, thank you so much. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about. I think you've, you've confused some of us also, but it's all in a good way, right? Because ultimately, we need to be thinking about these things to be asking the right questions. So... So I think you guys have done a wonderful uh, 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 task tonight. So thank you so much. Um, this is the second webinar that we've had and I can see the interest growing because people are, are concerned about their financial affairs. Um, so I, I really do want to kick, kick off a webinar series next year with you guys, probably on a monthly basis, just to keep informing our members on what to think about and what questions to ask their brokers, their advisors, uh, and ultimately their money. So they have to make decisions for their own money. Uh, and the best decision you can make is when you have the knowledge yourself and you can have rich discussions with people managing your money. So, so, I, so I think there's a, there's a lot of work to be done between us. Uh, but until we get to that point, thank you so much for all your efforts tonight. I think it was wonderful. Many comments, many members have commented. It was an eye opener, very positive comments. Uh, we'll know tomorrow once everyone fills out their review forms, how well we've done. Uh, but from the sense I get, I, I think I think it was a well-received webinar. So thank you so much. Thank you for your time, and hope we can collaborate on more interesting topics uh, in in the future. Thank you. Have a good evening, uh, colleagues. There's still almost 250 colleagues still on listening to our questions, so you can see how important this is to them. Have a wonderful evening. Enjoy your weekend, and we'll put together a range of awesome topics for the coming year. Uh, that will enlighten us even further when it comes to money matters and money affairs. Thank you and keep safe. Thank you, Dr. Mansur. Thanks, thank everyone. Pleasure. It was a privilege being here. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you.